Friday evening. And um, welcome back to our traveling members. Some we're seeing somebody for after a while. Uh, <coughs> you were also traveling, right? Uh, you were traveling, right? Uh, no, yeah. I didn't see you. Did Did you come in last week? Uh, no, no, I didn't come in last week. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome back. So we'll um, continue our discussion on the Bhagavad Gita. So we had finished the uh, seventh chapter of the Gita last time, and uh, eighth chapter is uh, attaining the absolute. It's uh, attaining the supreme. It's probably one of the most uh, fascinating chapters in the Gita because um, this is one place where Krishna talks a lot about something that he does not talk so much in the rest of the Bhagavad Gita which is uh, dying, the art of dying. The Bhagavad Gita is mostly about the art of living and 8th chapter is a bit of a tangent even in terms of the verse sequence. Um, the 7th and the ninth chapter they kind of gel together they have very similar uh, they have a very uh, similar flow and the eighth chapter is a bit of a detour and Krishna takes the detour to answer uh, uh, questions that are raised by um, Arjun so in the seventh chapter Krishna talked all about uh, us he talked about uh, uh, he, he talks uh, about 12 kinds of people in the seventh chapter which basically are people who do not take to spirituality, the four kinds of people who will not take to spirituality. And these are the atheists, the agnostics, the impersonalists, and uh, uh, the materialists. So, so he, you know, he, in the 714 he says, Namam prapadyante naradama maya parthagyana aswarik bhav ashrita so these four kind of people will never take to uh, spirituality and then he ta- kind of talks about eight kind of people that do take to spirituality in some form so um, one category in them is uh, what is known as sakam mishrit bhaktas so these are the category of devotees who will take to spirituality but for material desires so they will uh, worship Krishna uh, but they will say Krishna give me something so uh, he talks about the artho artharthi jigyasu people who are in material distress maybe sickness maybe maybe anxiety artharthi people who need wealth jigyasu people who are just inquisitive and the fourth kind which is which is Mokshakrat, people who are attracted to liberation. So even though one might consider liberation as a transcendental activity, but it's still contaminated with, with uh, uh, material desire. So a person who is seeking exclusively liberation is of the conception that uh, I just want to take care of myself to the exclusion of even God. So yeah, this place is not a good place to be with. In uh, a lot of trouble, lot of anxiety, Janmar Bhikthu Jaravyadi keeps going on again and again. So I need to get out of here. So what is the best thing that I can do to get out? Everything else is then secondary. Spirituality is secondary, relationship to God is secondary. They may use that, but the primary thing is that I'm in a situation that is not very comfortable. How do I escape from it? So but they use the process of bhakti because bhakti is the only process that can enable them to do that they use the process of bhakti to 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 achieve that uh, end goal so they're called sakam mishra bhakta then uh, the two kinds of um, um, nishkam mishra bhaktas that even though they are mixed devotion but uh, 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 the desires are very low and these are the gyanis the people who are pursuing uh, spirituality to understand more who am I who is God what's our relationship how do I serve Krishna what is the best way for me to serve devotees so uh, they have that uh, they have that uh, uh, the conception of uh, pursuing knowledge in order to increase in order to increase their 
uh, the devotion. So there's still Mishrit Bhaktas mixed up because uh, uh, they are not at the platform of spontaneous devotion. They will reach with the mercy of a devotee, but uh, at this point they are more uh, focused into knowing more. And the second kind of Nishkam Mishrit Bhaktas are the uh, Brahmavadis. And the Brahmavadis are the ones who are attracted to Krishna's impersonal form. So they are different from impersonalists. Impersonalists uh, deny Krishna's personal form. They say God is an energy, God is a force, you experience God along, all around. The Brahmavadis say yes, God is energy, God is force, but all that is based on, on a person. But because of their own nature, their propensity, they are not attracted to Krishna as a person. They are attracted to Krishna as, as, as the all-powerful, all-pervasive, all-knowing, uh, those qualities of, of uh, Krishna. Then uh, there is the, uh, the other category, which is the, uh, the Deva Upasanas, Upasak, the Deva Upasaks. So these are the demigod worshippers. So even though Krishna mentions them over here, Prabhupada says that they are not in the category of devotees because they have nothing to do with Krishna. They may be worshipping with a lot of faith, they may be worshipping with in the more of goodness, um, they may be pakka in what they are doing, but uh, they are not considered as devotees because they have no attraction to, to Krishna and their destination also is, is the planets of the demigods. So depending on which demigod they are worshipping, they may go to Indra Lok or Brahma Lok or Shiva Lok, different uh, uh, planets of the devas, and uh, uh, based on their uh, based on their attraction, they develop a certain kind of a, uh, a relationship. And uh, um, then, of course, is the Ananya Bhaktas. Krishna speaks about them. These are the pure devotees who have uh, no other desire but to worship Krishna in order to serve him. So Anabilashita Shunyam, they have no other desire. Jnana Karma Dhyanavratam. That their bhakti is not contaminated with knowledge, Gyan Karma Adi. By knowledge, by karma, by fruitive activities, Adi means by yoga or by um, any other things. Anukulena Krishna no Anushilanam Bhakti Ruttama. All they want to do is to serve Krishna in a way that is favorable to Anukul is favorable to to, uh, to Krishna. So after having spoken about uh, uh, this uh, this category of peoples, in the closing verses, Krishna talks about he he talks about the various the various conceptions with which these devotees develop attachment. So he said, those in full consciousness of me who know me, the Supreme Lord, to be the governing principle of the material manifestation of the demigods and of all methods of sacrifice can understand and know me, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, even at the time of death. So Krishna introduces Arjun to, to, um, to several new terms. He, so he says that... Uh, 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 that uh, Adi Bhutam, Adi Devam, Adi Adi Yagyam, then Prayan Kale. So, so uh, Krishna introduces these terms over here for two reasons. One, that one who understands Krishna to be the master of whatever these terms means. So, right now he is planting that seed in Arjun's mind. He says, one who understands me to be the master of Adibhaita, Adibhutam, Adidevam, Adiyakyam, uh, Advaitam. He, one who understands me to be the master of this <coughs> will know me in full. So it is a seed that Arjun will basically then uh, take and he will turn it around and ask for clarifications. So that is the opening of chapter 8. So chapter 8 is called the Attaining the Supreme. So before we start with chapter 8, just want to see if there's any questions or comments. Uh, um, chapter 7 is one of the more important chapters because this is the first time in Bhagavad Gita that Krishna starts talking about himself. In the preceding chapters, he's been mostly talking about us. The focus is the jiva. 
you do this, you can do this, you can do karma, you can do gyan, you can do astang yoga. So most of the focus is what can you do. And beginning from the seventh chapter, Krishna turns the focus to himself. And till the twelfth chapter, he will speak more about himself and also the relationship between the between the two. Do we have any comments or questions? Seventh chapter. Yes, so you mentioned the category, category, and even though there is a categorization, is it a journey? Uh, is it a sequence through which one traverses, or is it like you are in your position based on your circumstances and Krishna's mercy, and then that's how you just stay there? No, no, it's a journey. It's a it's, journey. It's a journey. Prabhupada, like, um, from some stages to some stages, it's a journey. Like Prabhupada says that uh, the jigyasur could become a jnani. A jigyasur is one who is inquisitive. Like, you know, what's going on? You know, who's this person that you are singing about? What's going on? So they have this, they have this inquisitiveness. But uh, once they delve a little deep, and then they see, okay, this makes sense. Then they start, they start following it with more gravity. So they can become, they can become jnanis. And uh, Prabhupada mentions that um, uh, with the mercy of a devotee, uh, from any of the 12 stages but well, 11 stages one can become a devotee right and we have we have we have uh, past times in the scriptures where people are atheistic or whatever it is but they get mercy of a devotee and they become ananya ananya bhaktas so, desiring moksha also a selfish desire as per the classification of Krishna. <coughs> so, if you don't desire anything, like it is hard to imagine, like you don't desire anything. Right, because right. desirelessness is not in our consciousness. We are constantly desiring something. Right. So, when that classification is made by Krishna, so how do we understand who that person could be who has no desire at all? Like it's very hard to imagine. So, it's it's not that it is an absence of desire. It's what matters is the object of desire. Mm -hmm. If the object of desire is yourself, mm -hmm. in an in a localized or an extended way, mm -hmm. right? That is calm. Mm -hmm. If the object of desire is Krishna or his devotees, that is bhakti. So there is desire in both cases. What what is the difference between the two is? Where is the desire focused on? So a devotee has a lot of desires. They want to serve the deities opulently. They want to serve the Vaishnavas very nicely. They want to read the scriptures. They want to get more and more service. So they're, they're full of desires. But the desire is in a way to, to increase the service of Krishna. Right? Like when we chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, we are chanting it full of desire. When we chant, we say, Krishna, please give me your service. I need more service. Right? It's full of desire. Focus of desire is Krishna or his we devotees. Krishna. Krishna or his devotees or his... So when, whenever we say Krishna, so Krishna is basically... Krishna never is alone. Krishna is always accompanied with his, with his devotees. He's always accompanied with his dham his holy place, he is accompanied with his word which is the scriptures. So when you desire to read the Bhagavad Gita, it's the same as desiring to serve Krishna. When you desire to do some service in a holy dham, it's the same as serving Krishna. Okay, make sense? Serving deities is serving Krishna. All, all are the same, they are all serving Krishna. In fact, uh, in the Adi Puran, Krishna says that uh, uh, one who considers himself to be my devotee, I do not consider him to be my devotee. One who considers to be a devotee of my devotee, he is dear to me. So, um, it's not that Krishna is saying don't become my devotee, but uh, uh, the mentality is that of Das Anudas Anudas, that let me serve somebody who is serving somebody who is serving Krishna. So like when you see in Vrindavan, everybody is trying to serve somebody who is serving Krishna. 
the gopis are trying to serve Srimati Radharani, the manjaris are serving the gopis, Radharani is trying to serve the gopis. You know, so everybody is trying to serve another devotee and in, in order to increase the service to Krishna. And the reason is that, uh, so, um, so, so to some extent the desire to be, be a uh, direct servant of Krishna is a covered form of egotism. Right. So it's like some if you're in a company and you say that um, I work directly with the CEO. Right. So because you are linked directly with the big person, you automatically become big. Right. So people say I work directly with the CEO, I work directly with the managing director. You know, so people say, you know, I'm pure devotee of Krishna. So they're saying Krishna is God, I'm Krishna's pure devotee, I'm directly connected to him. So there is some amount of that egotism over there. That I'm so Krishna is great. But uh, I'm also great because I'm connected to him. But can a service to Krishna be without that ego? It can be. It can be. But then that service will automatically uh, not have that mood of uh, that I am serving Krishna. Because uh, when you serve any service that you do, you're always serving under the auspicious of your parampara. You're serving under the auspicious of your spiritual master. You're serving under the auspicious of the senior devotees. So, uh, so the mood of service goes hand in hand with the mood of humility. Like when we, even when we do things like when we offer arti in the morning, the mood is that we are not offering arti. We first offer it to Guru Maharaj, then to Prabhupada, and then we offer it. So the understanding is that we are assisting uh, Srila Prabhupada Guru Maharaj in offering the Aarti uh, to uh, and it does not stop over there. So Prabhupada thinks that he's off, uh, he's assisting his Guru Maharaj. So whenever people would glorify Prabhupada, Prabhupada you've done so much and Prabhupada said that you know my spiritual master gave me some service to do. So he would immediately move the focus to his spiritual master there. So, uh, uh, the, the sense of uh, humility. One needs to, I'm sorry. Sure, go ahead. Please continue. So, so, the sense of humility, it goes, it basically dissolves the essence of why we are in the material world. So, we are in the material world because of our sense of ego. That I am, ultimately, that I am God in one form or the other. And this sense of humility, it dissolves that that sense. It it uh, replaces that with a sense of that I am not God, but I am the servant of the servant of God. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Thank you for the nice discussion. So, chapter eight, attaining the supreme. So, first few verses in the chapter 8 are technical and so you, you have to kind of, you know, bear with me on that and after that it becomes, it becomes, I would not say sweet because, you know, talking about death is never a sweet topic but it flows more easily. So, Arjuna Vacha, Arjuna asks, O my Lord, O Supreme Person, what is Brahman? What is the Self? What are fruitive activities. What is the material manifestation and what are the demigods? Please explain this to me. All these terms have been introduced by Krishna in the seventh chapter. Arjun understands them because he has already heard from Krishna in the seventh chapter. But in a guru-disciple relationship, it is incumbent on the disciple to ask the guru 200 times until he is unequivocally clear about what the answer is and it is the duty of the let's see it's the duty of the guru to answer the disciple as many times as he as he uh, asks so arjun is exercising the right or uh, that he has already accepted krishna as a guru he's exercising that right that you have said all this i think i understand but now i need to hear from you again so that I can understand it clearly. 
Yeah. So it's the capital B and the small b. <laughs> <laughs> the spelling is the same. <coughs> so literally, uh, a Brahman is one who knows the Brahman. That's the literal. That's how the word Brahman came. Mm -hmm. That he knows the Brahman, right? But uh, the the capital B Brahman is Brahman is the impersonal form of Krishna. The lower case is like you said, it's the caste. So, so, uh, so Arjun first inquires, what is, what is Brahman? And the reason he does is that he wants to clearly understand the difference between Jiva and Krishna. So, so, Piyali, to some extent what I told you will be contradicted in this verse, but there's a context to, to this. So, even though Arjun asks Brahman with a capital B, Krishna gives a little different answer to him. But uh, the context is that uh, Arjun wants to know what is the difference between Jiva and Krishna. He says, who is this Brahman that you talk about? Is it me or is it you? So, so, he, so he wants to get that out first out of the way. So there is no confusion. So the basis of uh, spirituality is Sambandh Gyan. The basis of Sambandh Gyan is three things. Knowing yourself, knowing the other person, knowing the nature of the relationship, right? So Arjun wants to be anchored in proper sambandhya. I need to know who I am, I need to know who you are. Doesn't ask so much about the relationship, but at least these two things I need to know. So he says, what is Brahman? What is self? So this is what is, what is Adhyatma? That... Uh, Am I, am I the body? Am I the soul? Am I the subtle body? The mind intelligence? Ego? So it's one of those questions that philosopher, philosophers ask all the time. That some, you know, like there's that, uh, I'm not sure who said it, but it's, uh, um, I, I think so I am. Which basically alludes to the fact that your existence is based on your intelligence. That because you're able, you're able to think, you're able to identify yourself as a living entity, right? And so and so and some say that you know we are there because you have the body. That we have the particular body, so this is what who you are. When the body goes away, you cease to exist. Or somebody somebody might say that even when the body goes away, even when the consciousness goes away, there is still you. So Arjun wants to. So Arjun wants to find out about this question that who am I? <coughs> what are fruitive activities? So karma. So karma is everybody's favorite question. That what are the activities that will... Uh, so in this context Arjun, so what we'll see is that the answers that Krishna gives is a little different from the questions that Arjun asks. And it's not because uh, Arj Krishna does not know the answer to the question that Arjun is asking, but uh, Krishna, you know, Krishna has this thing that uh, he, he does not give you what you want. He gives you what you need. So he is using this opportunity to guide Arjun to where Arjun should go. He's not completely ignoring the question or negating the question, but we'll see that he takes this opportunity to give the answer that would really benefit Arjun. So Arjun is asking about karma. That what is what is fruitive activities? What are activities that I perform daily? What about them? What are activities that I perform once in a while? What about them? So there are several kinds of of. Uh, of uh, uh, karma, there is nimit karma. So these are survival activities. You have to eat, you have to drink, you have to sleep, you have to breathe. So when somebody says you become a karma, then you don't give up your 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 nimit activities, right? Then there are 
nitic activities. So these are activities that you do because they are enjoined by the scriptures. You do the samskars, you give in charity, you protect the weak. So those are the activities that are enjoined in the scriptures. And then there are activities that are done under extraordinary circumstances. That uh, you're, you're sitting in a jungle, you see thieves are, 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 uh, are chasing some people and they come and ask you, that, uh, did you see some people running from here? And then you lie. You say, I saw them go that way. Right? So these are extraordinary activities that you do under, under. So generally it's a sin to lie. But under extenuating circumstances, it becomes a sin to tell the truth. So those are, those are extraordinary activities. So Arjun wants to get some understanding about the nature of activity. But Krishna does not go down that path. He gives a slightly different answer. What is the material manifestation? So, Adibhuta, that what is the material manifestation? Is it, uh, is it what I make of it or is it something more? <coughs> what are the demigods? So, Arjun is asking, uh, are you one of the demigods to Krishna? Or are the demigods a part of you? How are the demigods related to you? How are the demigods related to me? So, he is asking. He is asking this question. Please explain to me. So he addresses uh, <coughs> he addresses Krishna in this verse as Purushottam. So Purushottam, uh, Purush means a man or a person. Purushottam is the best. So Arjun is implicitly saying that you you are you are the best person. So you are fully qualified to answer this question that I am asking. So he continues asking question in the next verse, who is the Lord of sacrifice and how does he live in the body, O Madhusudan? And how can those engaged in devotional service know you at the time of death? So the Vedas enjoy sacrifices right? and um, sacrifices are of all kinds. So there is what we are traditionally understand sacrifices which is putting, doing a fire sacrifice. But uh, essentially anything that is done as per your prescribed duty is considered to be a sacrifice. <clears throat> so why? Why is it considered to be a sacrifice? Thoughts? Anything that you do as a prescribed duty is considered to be a sacrifice. Why is that? What is prescribed duty? So prescribed duties are those that are enjoined in the scriptures. So, so as a as a brahmachari, there are certain prescribed duties, right? So, depending on the varna and the ashram, there are certain prescribed duties. So, as a brahmachari, there are certain duties. As a grahastha, the prescribed duties for grahastha is to give in charity. The prescribed duty for a grahastha is to always keep the house open for guests. The prescribed duties for uh, uh, for a grahastha is to uh, to produce children who are spiritually well nurtured so several these are high levels but in this in manu samhita there are several lot of specificity that is given in terms of prescribed duties why are they considered to be sacrifices the time giving yourself you know, the what giving time giving your duties as a sacrifice in my opinion. Okay, giving time. Okay. It is not to be done with a selfish desire. Not to be done with selfish desire. Okay. It's like an endeavor to do these things. It's, it may be you like it or you may not like it. You still do it. That's why it's a kind of sacrifice. There's not all the duties where you willingly you might be doing. Okay. So you still do it as a dharma. Okay. Yeah. Sacrifice and sacred is coming from the same root. So they are basically the same similar thing. Mm. Mm. It's sacred to do sacrifice. Mm. Good, point. Sacrifice Good point. Um, I would say if it's not performed in this life and you have to come back and fulfill it 
Right, 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 right. That's a good point. So all, all good answers. Uh, the nature of uh, prescribed duties is that you do it whether you like it or not. Uh, in the second chapter, Prabhupada, in the purport, he gives the example that uh, Brahman is supposed to take bath in the morning and uh, cold water bath. So they will take it in summer, they will take it in winter. So they won't say that it's too cold in winter. So, you know, Om Pavitra Pitrova, they won't, you know, sprinkle some water and they'll take a bath, right? So, uh, so it's their duty. They will do it. And uh, whether it's, it's pleasing to the senses or not. Um, a housewife will cook in the kitchen even in the, in the hottest day of the summer. So even it's hot and she's sweating, etc., but she will still cook, right? So sacrifice in order to do the do the uh, do the duty. So so uh, <coughs> so Arjun is inquiring about that. What exactly is sacrifice? And more so, he's saying he's asking that who is this sacrifice going to? Because in everything there has to be a balance. If you make a sacrifice, somebody has to receive it so he's saying who is the who's the benefactor for the sacrifice is it me do I when I make a sacrifice do I do, am I the, 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 uh, the one who receives the sacrifice is the sacrifice done for somebody else where does the person live where does he live who is the adiyagya who is the receiver of the sacrifice and the last question that he asks is that that <coughs> Prayan Kale. Prayan Kale means at the time of death. That how can those engaged in devotional service know you at the time of death? So uh, Krishna will answer the first set of questions very succinctly. Because they are they are really the kind of questions that are answered in the sutras, in the Vedanta Sutras. And Krishna does not want to delve too much into it. He answers enough to satisfy Arjun. But the last question he will answer over the remaining chapter. So he will take one or two verses to answer the five questions. And the last question he will answer in a lot of details. So in a way, there is a correlation between the first set of questions. It looks like a non-sequitur. Krishna, Arjun is asking who is Adi Bhut, Adi Dev, Adi Yagya, Adi <coughs> and uh, uh, what is Karma? And then, he, then suddenly it seems that he's saying, what about the time of death? Right? It looks like it's a little disjoint. But uh, factually speaking, and Arjun is, is an exalted soul. Factually speaking, he is correlating everything that we do in our life to what happens at the time of death. So it's like throughout the life, like you have a calculator. Throughout your life, you're punching in numbers. 2 plus 4 times 7 to the power 8, this. And at the time of death, you press the equal to sign. And then you get the result. That's what happens to you. Right? So, Arjun is asking, in the previous question, he's asking everything that we do during our lifetime. The, the yagyas that we do, the karma that we do, the, the understanding of the body, and... But then all of that is basically there so that one can be properly situated at the time of death. So that is why he is also collating the questions in this way. So he is saying what do we do when we are living so that we can die in the way that we are supposed to die. So Krishna starts answering his questions. Sri Bhagavan Vacha. The Supreme Personality of God has said, the indestructible, transcendental living entity is called Brahman. So here he is answering Ar Arjun's first question that who is Brahman? And the answer that he is giving is that you are Brahman. So he is saying the Jiva is Brahman. 
right? So it's not that Krishna is trying to make Arjuna an impersonalist. Sometimes we say that, you know, not sometimes, often we say that Brahmavadis, people who are, who are too much uh, anchored into the conception of the impersonal aspect of Krishna. But Krishna is giving this answer to Arjun to make him understand that because uh, if you look at it, Krishna is not in play over here. Arjun knows Krishna is God. So Krishna is spiritual, right? The only person, the only thing in play over here is Jiva. Right? So Krishna is saying that you are Brahman, which means that he is saying that you are an eternal spirit soul. So he wants to make this as, as the foundation of the other answers that you give. So if you remember the very first instruction that Krishna gives Arjun in the second chapter, right after Krishna, Arjun surrenders to, to Krishna and then he says that, you know, I am a disciple surrendered unto you, please instruct me. So the very first instruction that Krishna gives to Arjun is that you are not the body, you are the soul. He says, Natvayam jatu nasham, natvam neme janadipa, nachevena bhavishyama sarvevayam tarvar. Never was there a time when you did not exist, when I did not exist, when all these kings did not exist, and never will there be a time when they will not exist. So past, present and future. He says that here, that here uh, your turn. So uh, the whole process of uh, transcendence is anchored on this conception that I, I, have, I am a spiritual entity. Because if you don't have that conception, then there is no point in one pursuing spirituality. Right? If you just think that I, you know, one takes birth and then dies, and whatever comes in between happens uh, through a series of coincidences, then the motto of life should be eat, drink, and be merry. Because all we have is this limited number of years, and after that, we come from nothing, we go to nothing, so everything goes away after that. <coughs> so, so you, you enjoy to the, to the maximum. Why do, we, why do we say that avoid sinful activities? Because there is this notion that because of sinful activities, there will be repercussions, either in this lifetime or in the next lifetime. Right. Even at the very basic, which is just coming to the mode of goodness, is you know it, it has to be anchored on the conception of that you're you're not the body, you're the you're the uh, you're a spirit soul. So Krishna is first telling Arjun this and telling us this that you are Brahman, that you are eternal spirit soul. The next thing he says is that, and his eternal nature is called Adhyatma. So, eternal nature over here, it's a, again it has to be taken in context. So, what is the eternal nature of the soul? Satchitanand. Jivere Sarup hoy? Krishna. Nitya Krishna Das. So, Sarup is, what's the Rup is nature. Sarup is, what is the? What is the eternal Jivere Sarupa and Nitya Krishna Das? That is the servant of Krishna, right? Krishna doesn't say that over here, right? He says that that uh, eternal nature is Adhyatma. So at this point, Krishna is talking about the embodied soul. He is not talking about the liberated soul. So what is the eternal nature? of the embodied soul. The eternal nature of the embodied soul is the swabhav, is the three modes of material nature that are there in the subtle body. So even though the material world is temporary, within the material world there is one thing that is eternal, within the confines of the material world and that is the subtle body. When the soul comes to the material world, it gets a subtle body and it will stay for the entire duration that the soul is in the material world. Billions of lifetimes, billions of life forms, whether man or demigod or animal or insect, same subtle body. Subtle body doesn't change, right? 
and based on the subtle body one gets a certain nature so which is called swabhav and swabhav is essentially what is the manifestation of the combination of the three modes of material nature that are there in your subtle body in the more of goodness more of passion more of ignorance and nobody is purely in that mode it's like you know you have three colors what are three colors red blue and uh, green right red blue and green and through that you can create infinite number of shades so similarly the more of goodness passion and ignorance mix and mix again and they create infinite numbers of propensities uh, swabhavs so adi atma krishna is saying that is your swabhav as an embodied soul what is your intrinsic nature that is that is your adhyatma then actions pertaining to the development of a material body of the living entity is called karma so you see krishna does not give the answer that arjun is seeking arjun was saying that tell me more about activities and what krishna is saying is don't worry about activities all activities that pertain to you getting a body are karma so whether it is good bad or ugly they are all karma like prabhupada would say that all karma is bad karma even if you are giving in charity even if you are giving uh, helping uh, uh, people uh, because what happens when you do activities in the mode of goodness you get punya you get punya and what's the result of punya and you have to take birth to enjoy that you have to take birth again to enjoy that I Which have a question. So when you say when you do some good activity, we believe that you get punya. I'm sorry, this question might sound a little bit off tangent because we do believe that we get something, but we do not have a material proof of getting some punya. But we do it because we think we must do it. Correct. But then it gives us a good feeling, and we kind of stay with that feeling for at least some period of time. <coughs> so i i just wanted to make that note i guess i yeah i agree with you how do we know we we don't really know that we are going to get something right we we have this concept of punya but we do we what's the validation what's the validation good question somebody wants to opine on it So I think Prabhu is asking a question that uh, we do pious activities based on faith that the results of pious activities are favorable, right? But what's the tangible proof for it? And the way I look at it makes you feel good. That's yeah. true. Uh, you yourself said that answer. <laughs> that, that's so an that's the way I look at it. You know. So that's, that's one tangible proof I that something in your body is. is attesting to the fact that you have done something good yeah. if you are a hungry man you give food to him he feels good you feel good that that's your qu- answer yourself okay what else scriptures. any other thoughts because the scriptures say yes. faith in the scriptures it's good point so because we have faith in the scriptures the scriptures say mm-hmm. that uh, good activities and bad activities have different reactions mm-hmm. so it may not be empirical mm. but then it is faith based there and uh, uh, and uh, a lot of it is what is considered to be even if you take the scriptures aside what is called collective wisdom that uh, right from the time I mean, unless you're born in like a grossly sinful family right from the time you're born you're given good good morals right you're given this is do this don't steal don't lie you know do you know etc why is collective wisdom because that's what your parents have been told by their parents etc and wisdom is knowledge that's been validated right so you may not be able to validate it within within the actions that you do maybe not even in your lifetime but collective wisdom means that that over hundreds and millions of generations hundred and millions of people have experienced that like if you go to vrindavan you will see people there are uh, doing so many uh, uh, pious activities 
very very explicitly to get something out of it they'll do charity and very specifically they'll do charity then they say that you know they'll give given charity and then say bless me that this thing happens so that defeats its own purpose it does not i mean it's it's material piety i mean we are we are not talking about shuddh bhakti over here mm. right we are talking about material piety that uh, you do something good with the expectation that something good will happen to you mm. right it's in the mode of goodness it's in the mode of goodness so later on krishna says there are two symptoms of the mode of goodness one is happiness and the second is detachment they appear out of if you are strongly in the mode of goodness mm -hmm. then the nature of the mode of goodness is that you will start becoming uh, you will start becoming detached if you practice it if you practice it consistently over a very very long period of time and you Yes, that is nishkam. That is nishkam. Because when you're doing it without expectation, then uh, then what is the frame that you are in? That uh, if you're not giving in charity, then who's giving in charity? There has to be a doer, right? Yeah. So you give somebody some money, and you say, okay, you know, it's not me. I'm not the doer. I'm not the enjoyer. Then who who is the doer? You automatically repose to Krishna. That because Krishna has given me the capability to make some money mm -hmm. and he has given me the opportunity to help the person so i am doing it now that becomes bhakti right it's no longer material and if there is some i mean sometimes we do charity we feel like i am doing this but i don't want anything and this can even some ego is there also right right so so there are two levels of detachment so one is known as karma phal tyag which is a slightly lower level in which what you say is lower is relative i mean it's a exalted level but relatively lower so karma phal tyag is that uh, uh, you make a lot of money and you're like okay i have made so much money for my enjoyment but then you say okay but this much i leave it for others so that is karma phal tyag you still consider yourself to be the doer but you don't consider yourself to be the enjoyer or at least part of it you say that i have a hundred dollars i'll only enjoy eighty dollars let me give twenty dollars to somebody else higher than that is nishkam nishkam is i didn't make a hundred dollars if it is not mine then there's no question of me giving it away it was never mine to begin with right so kanfal tyag comes from the platform of of satgun from the platform of mora goodness nishkam it comes from two platforms it's either gyan ashrit or bhakti ashrit so gyan ashrit is when you say i am not the body but the soul then you are saying that because the soul is not really doing the activities so the soul cannot be the enjoyer of the activities so it's gyan ashrit based on sankhya right bhakti ashrit is that whatever i am doing i am doing because krishna has empowered me to do so since i am not doing anything i cannot be the doer or the enjoyer there right and krishna talks about both of them in the in the bhagavad gita okay okay your question is like no i just want to um, i guess ask for so that when you say in the mode of goodness there is detachment and the other thing is that happiness right happiness so then um, when we say that uh, sometimes uh, good deeds and or you know, something like charity or, or some sacrifice it also there is a danger of developing some kind of pride or ego or um, you know a feeling of that sort of a false ego then then it cannot be in the mode of goodness right then it is what passion goodness or more 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 of passion it's more of passion more and more of passion then but the idea is that uh, that uh, as you do it more and more mm -hmm. then you start developing detachment as as you give more and more in charity 
then automatically you will start developing detachment like initially you will say that i am giving i am giving my 20 dollars to this person mm. later on you will say this is the 20 dollars that was reserved for this person no. to begin with right i'm just moving it from box a to box b yeah but it's a gradual that's why the more goodness of a gradual process right. there and it's uh, it's uh, also encumbered with many uh, pitfalls because uh, you could stay in this mode of i am i am giving this i am feeding this 100 people right. right look how great i am because of me these 100 people are surviving you could stay in that mood for a very very long time so once it's it could if there is mercy of a devotee right if there is if there is detachment then because of the detachment the cycle of karma can cease because karma happens because of attachment right the cycle of karma can cease but where will you get the love of Krishna from that you will get from a devotee so pe people who are in the mode of detachment they take to uh, devotion very quickly because they don't have anything encumbering them they have already divested themselves of their sense of i-ness and minus, minus. that they already divest divested with so they are ready all they need is some association of a of a of a devotee but that is needed you know if if that is not there then Prabhupada says that these people might eventually become they might either either they might become uh, uh, yogis or jnanis mm. they might become one of the two if they don't have the association of devotees there. Yeah. <coughs> anything else so going back to uh, Prabhu's question on tangible results this class uh, on Sunday that we had wherein he kind of explained the close relationship between spirituality and science and there is a benefit out of whatever we are doing yeah. as prescribed duties but we may not know its relation how mm. we are benefiting it but it is benefiting us like he gave us an example of Ekadshi uh, mm. fasting mm -hmm. and we may just do it in good faith mm. but uh, eventually it is helping us like he explained a scientific way that you know uh, you are getting away from the diseases uh, he proved it uh, in his own theory mm -hmm. if you are doing Ekadshi fasting Mm. And a lot of other things like if you blow the shank, it's uh, one of the yogas actually, which you know purifies your, you know clears your lot of uh, uh, things inside you. So he was proving that science and spirituality is actually very much related, and you can feel the dif uh, results of it in a very tangible way. It's yes. just that we may not understand it that way. So he was vouching for uh, mm. tangible benefits of spirituality. Right. But can it be I'm sorry. Can it be done for a tangible benefit is the question. Because once you get it, then you must put, do it for another tangible benefit and then for another. So um, so this was some of the discussion that we had in the previous chapter. Yes, sir, you can start off with that. Because you cannot become you cannot you cannot go to to the stage of being an Ananya Bhakta directly theoretically you could but practically it's very different difficult so what do you do you go approach krishna first as sakam bhakta right say krishna please give me this krishna please give me this and from sakam bhakta you become nishkam bhakta right and from nishkam bhakta you become ananya bhakta right so all all are devotees all are dear to krishna krishna says all these souls are magnanimous souls they are all dear. Why? Because whatever that they have done, they have found a way to relate to Krishna. In in the seventh canto of the uh, in the sixth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, when the Rajasriya Yag was being done, and uh, um, so this is that very popular pastime. We know that Shishupal got up and he started insulting Krishna, and he started you know hundred different insults that he gave. And then Krishna, then he manifested his uh, chakra and then he cut off his hand. And then Yudhishthir saw with his own eyes the soul of uh, Shishupal entering the lotus feet of Krishna. And he was very surprised. And he was saying that uh, there are yogis 
who for millions of years meditate to get the opportunity to 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 come in contact with Krishna and the Shishupal is such a rascal that Shishu so Yudhishthira knew about Shishupal because Shishupal is 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 related to to Yudhishthira and Krishna so you know the Shishupal even before he could speak he had learned how to curse Krishna and he had set up his life in a way that people would you know after they would drink, drink some people have this reflex after they will drink water and you know and they'll say you know Narayan, Jai Narayan, something like that. So Shishupal had trained himself that after whatever he did, he would curse Krishna after after that. So he says he was such a sinful person, so envious of Krishna. How did he get this opportunity? And then Narmani says, Yena Yena Prakrana. One way or the other, if you if you are able to attach your mind to to Krishna, your life will become glorious. He said, just like Shishupal was always thinking of Krishna with envy. Just like Kamsa was always thinking of Krishna in fear. And even though they were thinking in a negative way, they became purified. Right? So now as devotees, we don't want to develop that kind of a relationship with Krishna. Right? So we try to develop a relationship that is, and then Nagmuni says, how much more so for a sincere soul who is trying to favorably think of Krishna. That's us. We are trying to favorably think of, of Krishna. So even if it is contaminated by these desires that Krishna give me this, Krishna give me that, right? At least we are not cursing Krishna. Right? We are not angry at Krishna. One of the one of the things that is said that when you ask for Krishna, if he gives it to you, thank him. If he does not give it to you, thank him. You should not say that, oh Krishna did not give me this, so so you know, tomorrow onwards, only one laddu for Krishna for offering, <laughs> right? Until I get get this, or uh, you know, I, I was I was at the temple one day, and one person was telling me that uh, I used to worship Krishna, but then I had so many problems in my life that I stopped worshiping Krishna. And um, you know, and notion is that he he was basically relating to Krishna as one who whose uh, sole purpose in his life was to take away his problems. If he wasn't doing that duty, there's no place for Krishna in his life. So as devotees, we don't develop that, that level of consciousness. But it is okay for us to ask Krishna. Ultimately, what we do is we only ask Krishna for service. We know that's our goal. But as we work towards that goal, we develop our, we develop our asking muscles. That, you know, Krishna, can you do this? Krishna, can you do that? Krishna does it, Krishna you are so nice, Krishna does not do it, then there is a lesson for me. It was probably not beneficial for me anyway. Or Krishna did not consider me to be ready for it. Right? So we develop that, we develop that muscles of, of our relationship with Krishna. Okay. So, so over here Krishna defines karma as those activities that result in the creation of a material body so you see that you know it's such a masterful statement so he he encapsulates the whole process of existence in the material world in this those activities pious sinful whatever activities that result in the creation of a material body he says those are karma Next verse, it says verse number 4. O best of the embodied beings, the physical nature which is constantly changing is called Adibhuta. The universal form of the Lord which includes all the demigods like those of sun and moon is called Adideva. And I, the supreme Lord, represented as the super soul in the heart of every embodied being, is called Adi Yajna. So, um, uh, uh, of the of the seven questions that Arjun has asked Krishna, the first three questions relate to the Jiva. The next three questions relate to Krishna, and the seventh question is, how does the Jiva attain Krishna? 
So these three questions Krishna is talking about is himself. Then he says that the, that the physical nature which is constantly changing is called Adi Bhuta. And this point Krishna had already made in the seventh uh, chapter when he says earth, water, fire, air, ether. He talks about the 23 elements that comprises the material world and he says all of these are coming from me. So he is saying that so, so in one way he is telling uh, Arjun that this body that you have is not yours. Because what is the body made of? It is made of these gross elements. Right? It is made of these earth, water, fire, air, ether, the senses, the five uh, knowledge acquiring senses, the five working senses. It has the three subtle elements, earth, water, uh, mind, intelligence, ego. Krishna says they are me. Right? So what do we have in this material world? Right? Even our body is not ours. Now Krishna is saying it is his, but but uh, one of one of the one of the uh, the sayings that is very common over here is that when you leave, forget about all the wealth that you have. Even your body does not go with you, right? So even your body is 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 not yours. So he's 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 positioning uh, Arjun in the proper conception of what belongs to him and what does not belong to. Him. So he said, "This is me. All this this changing material uh, 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 elements that you see along around you, including your body, that is me." Then what about the demigods? And he says that the demigods are part and parcel of me. He gives the example of sun and moon because the sun and moon are most easily visible, but there are there are millions. There are three hundred thirty million demigods. And he is saying that all these demigods are me, Adi Daiva. I am the source of the demigods, and I am the I am the Adi Yagya. He says I am the Lord of the sacrifice. So ultimately, every sacrifice that we do is directly or indirectly going to Krishna. Third chapter, he makes this makes this point, right? So even when we are doing a sacrifice. So, so that is that is why prescribed duties are purifying. Because when you do your prescribed duties, you are sacrificing to Krishna. So because the Vedas are coming from Krishna. The prescribed duties are coming from the Vedas. So when we follow the scriptures, we are following what Krishna is asking us to do. So the sacrifice that we are making are, is basically for he is the enjoyer of the sacrifice. So these uh, three things, uh, uh, Krishna says, me. That is that is that is me. So if you look at these three, at, at these three um, um, ways that Krishna is is asking Arjun to relate to him, then uh, uh, so this will this you will relate to. Uh, this is spoken more in the Bhagavatam that if a person is is very strongly materialistic then how can they see God so they see God in nature right so they will see God in the trees and the mountains and the limitless skies and uh, the rivers and the oceans they will look at the grandeur of that so that is Krishna's Virat Rup. In the Bhagavatam, Krishna says that uh, these rivers are my veins, these trees are the hair on my body, these mountains are my bones. So he, he basically assumes the universal form, that this universe is a manifestation of me. So when people are not very advanced spirituality, then they can relate to things empirically. So that is the first level of realization that Krishna is saying that you can see you can see spirit in in matter then the second point that he is saying is that the universal form of the Lord which includes all the demigods so this is Adi Deva which is seeing Krishna seeing spirit in spirit the first was seeing spirit in matter so Adi Deva Adi Deva is divine is basically 
uh, how does the why, why do the seasons change why do the rains fall why does the sun rise in the in, in in the morning what is the divine power that keeps us breathing even when we are sleeping why doesn't our breathing stop at the at the uh, uh, at the time why do why does our why do our eyelids keep closing even without us knowing it there is so much of divinity that 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 is there so this is seeing krishna in that divinity and the third which is adiyagya is seeing krishna as the super soul where krishna says that you can see me as in in the heart of every embodied being so we know that whenever there is the jiva there is also whenever there is atma there is parmatma so more advanced is seeing the atma and the parmatma right so so krishna is is giving arjun these three he is still not talked about himself as a as a person but he is giving arjun these three understandings you can see me in nature you can see me in the divinity that is around you or you can see me in the heart of every living entity so six questions answered now krishna is going to focus on the seventh question and whoever at the end of his life quits his body remembering me alone at once attains my nature of this there is no doubt so krishna uses words like uh, asamshaya very rarely because uh, in a way everything that krishna says is the ultimate truth so he you know why would he say it's it's like you know if you're speaking the truth why would you say that over and over again but what i speak is the truth it's redundant but he says that once in a while for the sake of emphasis that pay special attention to like like when he said tat shunu tat shunu means that now listen to what i am saying now arjun is like i am obviously listening to what you are saying but when krishna says tat shunu that means now listen even more attentively right so so krishna is saying that of this there is no doubt that when one dies remembering of me he acquires a nature like me now this does not mean that the person becomes krishna what it means is that just like krishna has an eternal spiritual nature the jiva also becomes the eternal spiritual soul so he the jiva begins to reclaim their spiritual identity when when they die thinking about krishna so the question to you here is that why is it that this is this is so potent that uh, this uh, and krishna will of course explain it but i uh, wanted to hear your thoughts why is this thing so potent one mm-hmm. would think that life is more important than than death and but but you know krishna is saying this one thing you do you die thinking of me and you will get a nature like me mm-hmm. yeah so actually i wanted to make a comment before you ask the question sure <laughs> so the thing is in the early chapters uh, Bhagavad Gita keeps and Krishna keeps saying that you are the eternal soul. You have, there was never a time when you did not exist, and all that, mm-hmm. and all those descriptions of the, of, of the human. And then, at, in, in this verse, he gives so much importance to that point in time which is called death, mm-hmm. when the soul is leaving the body. Right. So, wha- this is it's contradic- contradictory in my mind. Like, you know, Seems to me. Yeah. yeah. yeah like, Yeah, your eternal soul is it's just like a garment that you wear in the body it's just like a garment you wear but the minute and you keep changing the garment again and again but the minute you leave this body is such an important time mm. that if you think of me at this time you will mm. attain my nature correct correct and so i it's a little contradictory contrary so almost like saying that uh, you know if you if you do some exercise while while sh- while uh, changing your clothes you will become eternally healthy right because that's what krishna says that vasamsi uh, jannani yathavi aya that this is just clothes and mm-hmm. as you go mm-hmm. old and the point you're making is is valid uh, that it's just changing of garments right and but at the same point while that is true this is also true how do we reconcile yeah. reconcile it yeah. so thoughts 
thoughts about it? Before that, can I make a remark? Yeah, sure. He says, remembering me alone. Mm -hmm. Is this word, word alone important? Ah, it is important. It is important. Yeah. The way I look at it, when man dies, his soul meets Krishna. So that's time, it's a joyful time for that soul, you know, that he is attending it. I know for the rest of us it's a sad affair, but for the soul it's kind of nice, you know, mm -hmm. that he's able to meet what he had been learning all his life, you know. This is the time when he really gets to see him. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that uh, this is one of the times when there is an opportunity, there's a potential at the potential. time that the soul can meet Krishna and that makes it, that's a very valid point. So that makes it special that uh, yes, at that point the soul has the opportunity to escape the cycle of yeah. life and death life. and go there. So it makes it special. What else? Other thoughts? Uh, Anirudh? Uh, when we divide in devotional form, uh, he coming to the material life, he know what he what he did and he know my feet these are the things things we did mm -hmm. uh, and when leaving the body he have some desire to correct them or uh, giving better chance that maybe higher standard of life so in that context if somebody remembers Krishna like please I mean forgive me all these things and it's that kind of uh, feelings will be mm. That would be helpful, yeah. Even though it's a little, um, um, you know, of course, you know, what a person thinks at time of death is, you know, nobody knows, but uh, there is this, uh, there is this Akbar Birbal story, which probably is not true, but still it makes a point, that uh, Akbar and Birbal were, was, were once standing on the top of their palace, and there was a young girl passing by. And, uh, and Akbar's eyes were following that girl and then he caught himself and then he said what's this I'm such an old man I'm an old person and why was I even looking at at her man people said you know that you know it, it is it is uh, it is natural and he said no it's not natural when does when does a man stop thinking about a woman you, you have to find out and tell me we will say come tomorrow morning get your daughter also so and get her to dress up nicely so next day Akbar and his daughter is there dressed up nicely and Birbal takes them to a small hut and uh, Akbar enters Birbal enters daughter enters and there's an old man that is lying on the bed on the verge of death and uh, um, um, uh, uh, the Bible says you look at the eyes of the man and the eyes of the man were only going to the daughter. So Bible makes the point that you know the emperor of the of the country has come into this old man's hut. A great personality has come. The old man knows that he has not very long to live. Yet where are his eyes going? So the point he makes is that you, even to the point of death you don't lose you, you don't lose that it's there. Um, uh, there so so to some extent that is also the answer to the question that uh, the death is actually a culmination of your life so whatever you do whatever however you have lived your life it 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 basically manifests itself at the time of death so uh, even though death from a you know, Piali's question that even though it's just a separation of the soul with the temporary body, but it is also an event that is that is a culmination of how you lived your life. And that's what makes it important. So saying that if you think of Krishna at the time of death is also saying that if you have lived your life 
thinking about Krishna. It's the same thing. That's why it is it, it is important. It is even more important, Prabhupada says in the purport later on, that uh, um, um, death is the, uh, is the single most traumatic experience in a person's life. And uh, um, uh, Prabhupada quotes the scripture in which they describe death in kind of graphic details. That how, you know, it's the stuff that happens to your body and your brain and your mind at the time of death. So, so despite all the trials and tribulations that you are going through, all the anxiety, all the bewilderment, you know, death is a once in a lifetime experience. You never experience it again in a lifetime. So, you know, otherwise you have some ex experience in it, right? You do bungee jumping, first time you get scared, second time you get less scared, third time you're like, you know, there. But death is, you know, once in a lifetime. So you don't have prior experience to that. So this is the this is the one and only time you're doing it in your life and you're still able to think about Krishna. This is the only one in time you're doing in your life and it is the most traumatic uh, event in your life and you're still able to think about Krishna. That's testimony to how you lived your life. Right? That's what so makes it. The practice of thinking about Krishna through your life, <coughs> you want to be able to do that so that at the, at the death, at the point of death, also it, you're it automatically. It automatically. At that point, you can't, because some people, even I, when I initially read it, I said, okay, you know, you live, live a life, you know, enjoy life and think of Krishna at the time of death. Right? Then you're set, you know, whatever it is. That's what many friends of mine have conception, like after 60 years they're going to start. Or right. Just right. so to say. It, so yeah, yeah. Concept. It's a very popular conception in, in especially in India that you know too young to go into spirituality, retire, you know, let your kids get there, but then it's too late to go because you're 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 you know you're you're already set. Uh, um, and I know we once went to visit an old gentleman, and uh, he was. Uh, I mean, he knew that he was going to die sh in a short period of time, right? And then, uh, then we said that, um, um, would you like us to leave a picture of Krishna in front of you? Would you like us to play? Uh, so he was lying, you know, this is US, this is impersonal. So he was lying in his room, there was TV in front of him, there was TV going on. He was all by himself, you know, his family was taking turns, but at that time they were not there. And but he said no. He said no. Because he wanted to watch TV or whatever we did, he said no. So um, um, it's it's difficult to do something that you haven't done. In the, in the, I mean, trust me, I know. I've been trying to exercise for such a long time, and uh, <laughs> doesn't happen. <laughs> it's like um, people can, like you know, the older person, they go and ask them what what is your desire. You know? So you try to fulfill desire, which could be material, but in a way we are taking them away from Krishna by doing that. Yeah. Say, what is your last desire? Yeah. He wanted to go that place or this place. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. wanted to eat in that restaurant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People try to fulfill the desire of the old person. What's your bucket the list? Person, yeah. but, but they do it differently, right? They do it thinking that once you're done with all these things, probably then but it your soul would be satisfied and you don't need to go. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Never yeah. happens. Never happens. Never happens. Like Never <laughs> happens. <laughs> Never happens. <laughs> It's a dramatic experience when you die. I, don't I said traumatic. I didn't say dramatic. It's very clear. Well, if you have not really died, then it's dramatic. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it's very painful. So how do you remember actually that time? How do you remember? Prabhupada says by practicing to remember that uh, the nature of a devotee is that whenever there is an anxiety, the mind naturally goes to Krishna. You know, so we practice that through our lives. So when we are in when we are in the ultimate mode of anxiety, mind naturally goes to to uh, to Krishna. So Krishna uses the word smaran over here. So he does not say that you know one who thinks of me. He says one who meditates on me. So the difference between thinking and meditating is that meditation is thinking with full realization. Is meditating with thinking with full sammandhyan, right? That uh, you're thinking of Krishna, but Smaran is you're thinking of Krishna that Jivere Swarupoy Nitya Krishna Das. 
that you are my Lord and I am your servant life after life. That is smaran. Right? Sometimes people, and there is nothing wrong, but sometimes people are dying, you know, they will say Krishna, you know, they will say Krishna, 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 and it is there to help, help the person. But it's not mechanical. It's not mechanical, it's like right? Otherwise, all the hospitals would have the tapes of Krishna running. You know, everybody would go back to Godhead, right? <laughs> People would die just hearing about Krishna, or they would have, or they would put headphones, or they would have photos of Krishna around. And you know, whether you like it or not, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's there. But it, Krishna says, "Smaran," that one who thinks of me with full realization of our relationship. Why did Arjuna ask this question? Because he was jiggyasu inquisitive. He was asking all these good things, right. what he should do and how he should do, but how did he come to this uh, thing that what I should do at the time of death, what happens? So, uh, so to some extent, like I said, the 8th chapter is, uh, is, is, uh, is a detour. So, 7th chapter, Krishna is speaking about himself. 9th right. okay. chapter, Krishna continues to speak about himself. The eighth chapter, to some extent, is what else is there, right? So, so even though Arjun, so Krishna kind of prepped Arjun because if you look at the last verses and the, you know, he he says one who thinks of me as Adi Bhati, Adi, you know, and then Arjun says, okay, you said these words, explain it uh, to me. So it's like Jiva, Krishna. In the spiritual world, it's a straight line relationship. In the material world. It goes through many prisms, the, you know, the prisms of karma, the prisms of desire, birth, death, many prisms it goes through and it gets distorted. So, so Arjun is trying to identify those, 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 but he does it very briefly because his focus is not so much on, on using the material energy to get to Krishna, his focus is more on using Krishna's energy to, to get on Krishna. Okay?